We are going to go through hairs and fibers evidence in this video. So we'll look at the different parts of the hair, the different types of fibers, and then how these can be used in forensics. So hair is made of an important protein called keratin. All right, the hairs are produced from hair follicles. So if you look over here in the picture, you can see what a normal hair follicle would look like and how it would promote hair growth. All right, but then if someone was uh, to go bald, basically what happens is that follicle will shrink and eventually you get to a point where the follicle is so small that no hair actually grows. Okay, so you get these follicles during uh, your fetal development and you don't get any more after birth. Uh, so that's why once they do shrink and kind of um, get smaller, that's why baldness, um, you kind of can't really fix it. Uh, and then the color in a person's hair is due to the different pigments uh, that are present in the hair itself. There's a lot of different things that affect a person's hair, including genes, all right, so that your genes can determine, you know, the shape or texture of your hair, but there's a lot of natural things that we can do to the hair uh, that can uh, mess with the appearance, like, you know, nutrition, uh, you know, there's, there's people will do intentional things to it, like uh, getting it curled or permed or dyeing it. Um, by looking at a hair, you can determine maybe where uh, on the body that hair came from based on its length, shape, or size. Uh, but in order to have DNA, you must have the root present. So just finding a hair doesn't mean you're automatically going to get a person's DNA. If the root is not there, the DNA will not be present. So if you look closely here at this picture, that's showing you the root of that particular hair, and that would contain the DNA. There are three main parts of the hair here. The outer part we call a cuticle, all right? So you can see that here in yellow in the picture. The outer part is a cuticle. It's made of these overlapping scales, all right? Um, the inner part here, the very, very middle, is called the medulla, all right? That's the central core. And then the cortex is kind of just outside the medulla, and that's where um, the color originates from. Okay, so the cuticle is the outer part, the medulla is the middle center part that runs down the center of the hair, and then the cortex is around the medulla that contains the pigment. So it's very easy to think of the structure of the hair as being like a pencil, okay? So the, the outer kind of paint covering of the pencil would be like the cuticle, uh, the medulla would be like the lead part, right? And then the cortex would be the wood on the inside underneath the paint. So as I said here, the cuticle is made of these overlapping scales, all right? So um, the cuticle itself can have different types of scales. There's three basic patterns, the coronal, spinous, and imbricate. And you can see all three of them here in the picture. Uh, so you can take a look at them and see, you know, how they're different. Coronal's kind of like, I always like to think of it as like donuts being stacked on top of each other, all right? Whereas something like imbricate's kind of this like overlapping pattern. All right, almost looks like like some type of weaving taking place. Um, so it is very useful here to help differentiate the hairs of different species, but it's not useful in determining if the hair is from a different person. So you can look at the cuticle and say, okay, well, it's human versus, say, dog hair, but it's a little bit more difficult to say that, you know, a particular hair belongs to a specific person just by looking at the cuticle. All right, so the cuticle has some variations and it. it could be different size. Um, there could be pigment present or maybe not. Um, so you, you can sometimes see these um, scales when you're looking close at a hair. Um, but the good news is you don't have to memorize the different types of the cuticle patterns. Uh, but you should be aware that there are different uh, patterns that exist. The cortex, which is just outside the medulla, is the part of the hair that is the most important in determining uh, if a hair belongs to a specific person or not, okay? So this would be the part of the hair that's very useful for that. Looking at the cuticle doesn't really help determine um, which person the hair came from, but the cortex would. Uh, and the cortex can be different colors, thickness, texture, um, when you're comparing uh, different people here. So a very important part of the hair itself. The medulla or the middle part is very important for determining different species, but just like the cuticle, it's not helpful in determining uh, whether or not a, a hair came from a specific person, 
All right. So sometimes the medulla may not even be there at all. You won't see it, but it can vary in thickness. Sometimes it might look like it's broken. All right. So uh, you can kind of look at some of these pictures. You can kind of see here in the pictures. It looks like the medulla is broken a little bit. And then sometimes it's not even there at all. OK, so the medulla has some variation here, but just like the cuticle, not very helpful in determining if a hair belongs to a specific person. In order for there to be DNA present in a hair sample, the root has to be there. So the root has the DNA, and if it's not present when the hair sample is found, you won't be able to get DNA from that sample. Uh, but the root also provides other information that's important. You can look at the root and determine if the hair was pulled out or if it fell out which is very important in a crime because uh, this would give some information about whether there was a struggle or if something else had taken place. So if you look at the picture here at the top, uh, the root is pretty much kind of intact, looks kind of uh, nice and clean versus down here, you can kind of see it doesn't look um, as nice as the one that just fell out. You can see that there was probably some kind of struggle that took place. So the root has the DNA, but it can also provide some other clues here about what might have happened in the crime. Hair is a very common form of class evidence unless you have the root, unless you have enough of the DNA present in a hair sample, uh, it's just going to be a form of class evidence. Uh, it's not going to be able to identify a specific person, uh, but people, you know, shed hairs daily all the time. So if you look at the fact there, um, it says that about a hundred head hairs per day are being shed. So you figure in a 24 hour period, you're losing about four hairs for every hour. Um, so a lot of times this is the type of evidence that's left behind at a crime scene. Uh, and you might not even realize that uh, your hair fell out. A lot of information can be learned from hairs that are found at crime scenes. So just by looking at the hair, you can determine, you know, if it was a human hair or an animal hair. Sometimes you could determine the race uh, by looking at the hair. You could also figure out, you know, based on the hair and the thickness, you know, where it came from on a person's body. Was it, you know, a head hair, an arm hair, um, something like that. You can determine by looking at the root if it was forcibly removed. You can also determine um, if the person had done any type of chemical treatments to their hair, do you know, did they go to the beauty salon and get it dyed regularly? Um, but you can also use hair as kind of a timeline of drug use by examining the hair. You can see if drugs were taken and then also a history of the drug use, depending on the length of the hair. So you can gather a lot of information here from hair if it's found at a crime scene. If you look at hair under a microscope, there's a lot of physical differences that you can see in the hairs, but it's very important that you understand that there's differences between human and animal hair. All right. So these are the things you would expect to see um, different between human and animal hair. So in humans, the medulla is typically about one third the width or less, but in an animal, the medulla could be much greater than that. It almost looks like it takes up more of the hair itself. So if you compare the human to the cat hair here on the left, you can see the human hair, the medulla is barely visible there in the center. But if you look at the cat hair, it's a very large prominent part of the hair. All right. Um, you can also see this banding pattern in terms of the coloration in animals where humans usually just looks like one solid color. Uh, in terms of the cuticle, uh, you usually only see the imbricate pattern in humans. But in animals, you could see all three. All right. So if you remember those patterns that we saw with the cuticle, you could see all three in animals, but only imbricate for human. Uh, and then in an animal, most of the pigment is very, very close to the medulla. So again, if you look at this picture of the cat, you can kind of see the pigment kind of being closer to that medulla, whereas in a human hair, it would be more spread out. So these are some important differences between human and animal hairs. This slide is just showing a comparison between the different types of animal hairs, and you can even see human hairs on here to compare them. But typically you would see uh, a larger medulla in animal hairs, uh, more of the color closer to that medulla in animals. Humans, the uh, color is going to be kind of more spread out. And if you could actually see the cuticle patterns, you would see all three 
in animals. Okay, so you can take a look at this slide, pause it if you need to, to look at the different types and make comparisons. Fibers are very similar to hairs in that they are a form of trace evidence that can be found a lot of times at crime scenes. Um, so it would actually be very useful if you could find unique fibers at a crime scene to be able to match them to a specific person. But a lot of times there's just common fibers found, so they're not too helpful with uh, respect to finding an exact person. But a lot of times where they're more helpful is with cross transfers. Okay, so if you can find similar fibers um, between two people, that can tell you a lot of information about maybe they were in contact or maybe they were together or in the same area. Okay, so they're typically not going to be able to identify an exact person, but they can definitely key you in on the likelihood that um, people were together or in the same areas. There are two different types of fibers. The first type we're going to look at are called natural fibers. These basically come from nature. They are fibers that come from plants or animals. So some good examples here are silk, cotton, cashmere, wool. If you look at the pictures here, cotton you can see here on the left is the most commonly used plant fiber. And then wool here on the right is the most commonly used animal fiber. And if you look closely at the picture, no take notice of what you're seeing. Uh, these are natural fibers, so they don't look as perfect. They're not kind of uh, as perfectly arranged as you might expect for a fiber here. Uh, and we'll compare them to the second type of fiber in a second. Uh, but these are coming from nature. That's the key to remember. They're coming from plants and animals. Synthetic fibers are the second type of fiber, and they are man-made fibers. Okay, so I like to think of these as being synthesized. Okay, they are made. So some examples are nylon, rayon, polyester, spandex, uh, and these make up a large portion of the fibers that are produced. So if you look at the pictures here, you can see how these are different from the natural fibers. All right, so they look like they are, you know, perfect. All right, because these were man-made. All right, natural fibers are coming from plants or animals, so they don't look as perfect under the microscope. These kind of have this perfect structure to them. All right, so that's a big difference between synthetic and natural fibers under the microscope. So if we compare here the natural and synthetic fibers, uh, we can see some of the differences here under the microscope. So cotton here on the left would be your natural fiber and rayon on the right would be your synthetic fiber. All right, you can clearly see how the synthetic fiber is kind of nice, beautifully, kind of a nice organized um, fiber there versus this one doesn't look as organized because it's coming from nature. All right, so you could see colors, you could see thickness, um, but you can also see something um, called a delusterant when it's present. Uh, sometimes delusterants are added to fibers to make them less shiny, especially a lot of these man-made ones. Um, they would be very, very shiny, so they add some delustrant to them so that they are not as shiny. Uh, but you can clearly see some of the differences there between uh, the natural and synthetic fibers. Here are some more microscopic views of the natural fibers on the left and the synthetic fibers on the right. You can see here that these kind of on the left, the natural fibers are not as perfectly organized as the synthetic fibers on the right because those are man-made. This picture is just showing you a delustered fiber up close. Remember, a lot of these fibers would be very, very shiny, so they add a delusterant to it to make them uh, less shiny. So you can kind of see this speckled appearance that the fiber has here, and that would be important so that the fiber is not going to be as shiny as it would be without it. So a lot of times if you are trying to figure out uh, what type of material a fiber is. There's a lot of different things you can use here to differentiate the fibers. You could look at them under the microscope. You can burn them. Okay, they will burn differently. Maybe um, some will kind of, you know, curl away from the flame. Some might melt. Some might leave a residue. Sometimes they give off a different odor. Um, so there's chemical tests that you could do to the fibers to figure out what type of fiber it is. You might be able to analyze the dye or the density. So there's definitely different ways here you could. Uh, analyze the fibers to figure out what type of fiber it is. This slide is just showing you a comparison here between different types of fibers. So you can look at this uh, and see uh, how some of these fibers might look under a microscope.